Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, I'm really pleased to be here, and normally um, the talks would be about, you know, some nice finds on some interesting sites, and here's some fantastic photos of those interesting finds. Um, so it's a really good opportunity um, to, to be to able to talk about other aspects of being uh, an archaeologist in the field, uh, particularly in commercial archaeology. Um, and as Sadie said, um, personally, I've been working as a commercial archaeologist for over 30 years. And um, so all my kind of uh, anecdotes and experience and um, photos will be from London, because that's where I've been based for 30 years. Um, but with that in mind, probably one of the most um, kind of unusual or interesting questions I've ever been asked was um, on one of those occasions where I worked abroad um, briefly on a kind of research, um, uh, kind of, uh, what's the word? You know, you're training people, training people, <laughs> excavation. <laughs> Um, and there were really tall, uh, two tall American students, and what they wanted to know was not um, what it was like for someone to be running an excavation in central London, uh, nor even what it was like to be a woman running um, a site in a very male-dominated construction industry, which is another session going in another room. Uh, but they wanted to know um, how I managed to do it being so short. <laughs> <laughs> um, and until that moment, I hadn't really thought being short was an issue. But um, as we shall see, um, being um, of challenged uh, sort of height um, is uh, has actually does have its problems. And this is where I pressed the wrong thing. So I'm just going to give a bit of background to some basic things that happened in the 90s that have led to the kind of environment that we work in today. Starting off with PPG 16. And this kind of came about as a result of um, two or three major projects, including the Rose Theatre, um, and you had Dustin Hoffman on TV saying, please save it. Um, and because of that, um, basically, the kind of law changed to um, factor in archaeology into development. And that meant that changes in management of construction sites, and we went from single to multiple occupancy, um, which is good in some ways, but um, a bit of a nightmare in others. Um, for example, this is us at Moorgate, it's kind of spot the archaeologists. Um, there are two in there right in the middle, can you see them at the sort of back there? Mm -hmm. So basically, mo I say over 95% of um, sites in London are um, run by a main contractor, principal contractor, and then we're sub sort of contracted in as all the pilers, the scaffolders, the concreters, the rebar guys, and it can be quite hectic. So. Um, the kind of order of it is is that uh, demolition guys get in there first, and then we can actually be, you know, excavating the basement as they're taking the building down above us. So we follow demolition, and then behind us come the pilers. And because the cost of getting the piling rig in is so massive, and uh, because you've got to do road closures and everything, so nothing is movable on the piling rig coming in. So of course, any problems at all with the demolition phase, like this more asbestos than they thought in the building. Um, the knock-on effect is on us, and that happens on almost every single site I've ever been on. Our time gets squashed, and it never moves at the end because the fine for not getting the piling rig in on time is much greater than the fine for machining out archaeology. So that is an issue. Um, here we are at Liverpool Street on Crossrail. We're doing some medieval pits there. And to be honest, if I'd known um, what I know now about Crossrail, we probably wouldn't have uh, rushed so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, here we are working in various kind of tiny areas. Imagine getting a spoil out for that. That was a bit of a challenge with my colleague Rob Hartle. So obviously we're doing kind of unusual squash spaces, pile locations, service trenches, whatever the contractor's doing really. Um, in fact, we will work anywhere. <laughs> so, um, so next thing, um, in 1992, uh, <coughs> PPE regulations came into force, which was fantastic because it's the first time that employers were made responsible for providing PPE to um, their staff and maintaining it. And that made a massive difference to um, everything. Um, because prior to that, um, <laughs> even with, uh, like, that's 1986, that's Julian Hill who still survived this and is still <laughs> with us now. But um, that's 1986, Wood Street, and uh, the having to wear head protection didn't come into 1989, so even that, he's ahead of his time there. <laughs> but obviously that wouldn't do him any favours at all if that lot came in on him. Around the same time, going back to Liverpool Street again, um, this is the initial phase of excavation there, um, ahead of Crossrail obviously, um, but that looks more like a kind of bring and buy sale, quite a relaxed <laughs> feel about it, whereas this is 30 years later, 
Uh, in fact, it's exactly 30 years later, and we did have one member of staff, Portia Askew, who was on both phases, so mm. all credit to her. But you can see like proper edge protection um, and proper PPE, and uh, that's all fabulous. As is um, the introduction of kind of women's PPE, and that's kind of in the last five years, I'd say, that we kind of got it kind of into that, or well, that's when I'm aware of it anyway. Um, and for so short women like myself, <laughs> brilliant. Um, and it's all kind of more fitted in better sizes and also better for small men as well. Except for, and it's always a criticism, but the purple trim <laughs> makes it look female. So I've known one bloke to colour it. I don't know. Because, yeah, why not just make it smaller sizes? But anyway, it's still really good. And it also means that women have got a kind of more of a visual, they're being acknowledged as being on site and needing PPE. So that's massive anyway. So our last thing on this 90s list um, is the introduction of CSCS cards, um, uh, construction skills certification, so I'm sure most people here are aware of that. And it was brought in um, as a sort of uh, an answer to, um, again, poor health and safety, trying to make everything safer on site. And unfortunately, though, it kind of made it harder for volunteers, and that's kind of when we saw a drop off of volunteers, because it's another hoop for them to jump through and the cost and everything. So. Um, bit of a demise, so that's a shame. But just to zip through this, um, it was fine until 2017, I would say, and then it, they, they added in the professional accreditation thing, which then managed to exclude uh, or cause enormous problems to a lot of people who'd come in in the 80s, not with a degree, basically, um, and yeah. people who'd come in through the NSC scheme or who'd volunteered and then got a job and who had over 30 years experience. It meant that they were invisible in the system and it was ridiculously unfair. Um, and from the CSCS website, they prove, provide proof that individuals basically have the required training and qualifications, which isn't really true. It means you've passed the test. Um, and then CIFA, unfortunately, I, I think unfortunately, it's my personal opinion and not Muller's opinion, <laughs> got involved and then from their website, they're saying the cards recognise the high levels of skills that archaeologists have, which again I don't believe is true because um, to get a job now, you most people have a degree. And if you've got a degree, if you've got a degree like me, you'd spend maybe three weeks in a field in France somewhere and you don't have um, any idea of what it's like to be on a demolition site at all. And you probably haven't really dug much and somebody else might have planned everything for you, recorded it for you. And here's an example uh, from the test, um, which is nothing to do with archaeology anyway, so here's an, an example of how you can be skilled. So if anyone got, anyone got, who thinks A for that? Anyone? Yeah, B, anyone? What about C? Yeah, come on, you're all archaeologists, you should know this, you should know this, no? It's B, it's B. But that's what I mean, to pass the test you have to memorise these, and that's it. Uh, while I'm criticising this whole thing, uh, the real cost dig for an individual five years, the CSCS card, if you've got a degree, basically, it's 57 quid. It might have gone up again because they put it up because of admin costs, because so many people had to get one. But if you are Italian, say, and you've got a degree, it's more than double that for the compatibility test, and so you're looking at over 100 quid. Um, I mean, to be fair, uh, companies do um, pay for them, but not everyone is in a company when they have to get their cards, so they are putting the money up front. Um, and then if you don't have a degree, in order to carry on working at all, you either have to get a degree, get an NVQ in archaeological practice, or join CIFA, which I think is really unfair, actually. <laughs> and there's three grades, of course, as we all know, these, and there's the total cost over five years. And um, of course, uh, the PIFA and the, mem the associated member it, of course, everyone knows that it means that you're kind of basic, better, and even better because you've had something published if you're MIFA. And um, a friend of mine who's been in archaeology for over 25 years but was with between companies um, had to get his own card because I know you get the money back, but he had to put, find the money up front. Um, it was Boris, actually. Um, and so he got the PIFA because that's what he could afford. So that's on his CV. So someone looking at 50 CVs might just choose me first and that's him in the bin and so the danger there is that it's the potential issue of money ahead of skills. That's my problem with it really. Another bugbear of mine is the whole <laughs> zero harm thing. There are positives there. There are positives I've been waiting for. Anyway, 
zero harm, zero injury, zero everything else. And of course, it's a good idea to not go home and, you know, injured. Um, but um, the whole thing kind of, it's all this high profile for the public and getting more work and it's all big companies. And it basically initially was linked to uh, managers getting bonuses. So they wanted you to have no accidents, they, they get their bonuses. So people, there's a lot of pressure on people to not have accidents. So of course, if you've got a major accident on site, you can't pretend it's not happened. But minor ones, I don't know any other contractors who report minor accidents on site. And I've seen them, I've seen them have accidents and they don't report it for two reasons. Um, managers come down really hard on them. And this happens to us. Um, we had a minor accident on this site, uh, Moorgate, and as a result, it was like, right, we're going to make every single edge safe for you. And of course, you can't get the spoil away. The next thing you've got to excavate anyway is the stuff with the scaffolding through it. And anyway, you end up with a row of scaffolding uh, holes through your Roman floor or whatever it is. So it's kind of, um, it, uh, it's, so I think it's partly designed to put you off, actually. And I think, anyway, I think that's true. And the other thing is because archaeologists are really good at reporting accidents and near misses. And because we're the only ones that do the minor ones, it looks like we're the only people having the accidents. And therefore, we're seen as a bit of a liability. We're seen as not being very safe. And the opposite is true. And here's the proof. We have all these bits of legislation and training, risk assessments, inductions, toolbox talks, site visits, confined spaces, asbestos, manual handling, cat and journey training, UXO, la la la, supervising safety, first aid, and now mental first aid for a couple of units in London as well. So it's very involved, and I'd say we're pretty safe. Um, something that's appearing on, well, has appeared for a long time, and a lot of the main contractor will put this at the edge of the site before you go in, and it's a really useful thing with a whiteboard. Not very good photo, mind you, but the whiteboard activities for the day, and then you've got your eye wash and stuff. And then you've got your mirror with meet the person responsible for your safety. Of course, being short, <laughs> I couldn't reach, couldn't reach the mirror. So when I looked in it, I couldn't, there's no one. <laughs> but all this stuff, all this sort of box ticking as well, doesn't mean anything's particularly safer. And on some smaller sites in London, this is a watching brief I went to uh, a couple of years ago, and that was the site access. And even if you didn't want to sort of uh, scoot down there, the ladder's too short. So I just stood in the port cabin. <laughs> I wasn't going to go anywhere near that. And then uh, this is one cut to <laughs> Sadie, that's, that's the main contractor doing a bit of measuring. So it doesn't actually mean that uh, health and safety, of course, there are advances and it's really important and it's fantastic, but it doesn't actually mean that people are actually carrying it out. Anyway, so you get your CSCS card and you turn up on site and this is for all subcontractors, so it's not just us, but it's quite a big deal, I think. These are all the things that you can be asked, well, you definitely ask for that every time, national insurance number and fingerprints, whole hand scan and retina scan are all things I've been asked for over the years to do the turnstile thing to get into site. Um, passport number and photo, uh, urine samples, breathalyzer test for drugs and alcohol, obviously. Um, medical and detailed information about family health, and that's all stuff from just turning up on site. Um, in fact, the only things that principal contractors don't know about me are that um, I once literally bumped into Jason Donovan in 1989 at Camden Market, and I quite like knitting but never make time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, going on to wages and worth, um, am I okay for time? Yeah, I've got um, the wages. The wages are one thing, but the worth, I think, is an important point. Um, uh, a few years ago, Dr. Joe Flatman, who works for Historic England, wrote a brilliant guide on top 10 tips about how to become an archaeologist. And one of them was this. Everyone who's ever ended up with a job in archaeology, from the lowliest digger to the most senior professor, has hit a low at some point where they wonder if they'll ever get work and whether so many struggles are worth it. And the, the point I want to make here is not the struggles and it's worth it. The lowliest digger. It's that attitude, the lowliest digger. And there's nothing lowly about a digger at all. And someone who's a good digger, it's a real skill. And the word specialist is given to loads of other people who are specialists, but so are good diggers. And they're, they're worth their weight in gold. And it's, it is a, it's not just digging a hole, as we all know. It, there's a skill to it, and it's not recognized. <coughs> and another quote from Andrew Selkirk, who admittedly, with all due respect to him, isn't a big fan of... Um, <laughs> commercial archaeologist 
But his point, which is right enough, amateurs are serious archaeologists who do archaeology in the spare time for love, not money. But I would say that commercial archaeologists are serious archaeologists who do archaeology in their whole time for love, not money. Because it's certainly not about the money. And this is the wage range in London at the moment. <coughs> and I know it's for in academia as well. It's not just on commercial sites. Um, but I, I put the guy in the gate in there because the site I'm on at the moment, I mean, I earn a bit more than that because I'm running a site. But the guy in the gate still earns more than me. So that's kind of, it just, he should be earning that. That's the point. It's not that, you know, I should get some of his money. But, <laughs> um, and then I just want to put in this over-educated. Um, the other day in the, t in the hut, I looked around and there's five people doing paperwork and two of them had PhDs. And we're a really ridiculously qualified, over -qual well, over-educated, I don't know, educated load of people. Loads of diggers have got MAs as well. Um, and I, it just seems to me like an underused under resource in some way. But the other point I want to make is, the thing you cannot learn in the classroom is how to interpret this stuff. And you can't teach that in the classroom, no matter, you know what I mean? It's, it's a, it goes back to that thing again. Sorry, I, I just went through it with the... There we go, there we go, there we go. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's yeah, you can, you've got people who've been digging for years and don't really know what they're looking at. You know what I mean? You've got people who turn up and you can tell that they've got an eye for it. And that, that's the thing. That's the thing that makes someone good. Anyway, um, another thing that we do, which I think is under resourced as well, but that's maybe about lack of um, links with people. Um, this is site Moorgate. The next picture you'll see will be flipped round. So the big concrete blocks at the top are at the bottom. But this is a plan of everything digitised from that site and then from that we can take all the Roman timber buildings from that and it's that sort of information that kind of pieces into a jigsaw of London and that I think could be, there should be more um, communication with universities and they could use this because it's the latest information and blood, you know what I mean, a bit more kind of, um, we could use each other more I think. Anyway, I'm just going to kind of end with a bit about um, <coughs> publicity, media and the public and everything. Uh, this is Sadie's site, brilliant. Um, if, you, if the developer's got money, it makes a big difference, doesn't it? You can get engaged with public a, a lot more. And I would like to say, after all the negative stuff I've just said, I, I do absolutely love my job, or a lot of bits of it, otherwise I wouldn't have been doing it for as long as I have. And I, it's not just the archaeology, obviously, it's archaeologists. Archaeologists tend to be people who don't have material possessions as their high priority thing, because it is about, it's, you know, there isn't the money and people who are a bit willing to travel and they're kind of open-minded and you know there's a sort of they're fantastic a lot of them are fantastic um and i had another point and i forgot what it was uh but and the public <laughs> yeah, that was it. the public one of the best things ever about um being an archaeologist the thing you want is for the public to know what it is you found and all the sites we've got are hoarding around them and people don't really know what's going on so that does make a difference having that um and the other thing they do as well is they make everything more gruesome, like on that site as well, we had a cremation and they recorded it as body found in cooking pot, <laughs> sort of thing. But, but we need them, we need them, and it, it matters that people find out what we're doing, because we're not just doing it for ourselves, we, do it, we are doing it for everyone else. And I'd just like to end with a story, again from Crossrail, we did have a public viewing gallery at the edge there, and three lunch times a week, people came in, and people were queuing to come in, it was brilliant, we had over a thousand people, and we put some archaeologists in the gallery each lunchtime and uh, Jess was one of them at one point and anyway, early on we had a ghost hunter and a clairvoyant <laughs> come to and at that time we had loads of burials you know it's the bedlam burial ground and they um, said to her they were looking at horror and they could they said well we can see loads of souls wandering about you've got to stop the excavation straight away the archaeologists are, are um, in danger and she said well we can I'm afraid we can't stop it um, and we do, we're very respectful with each one with the old skeletons that we lift. And they said, well, tell your archaeologists then that they have to wash their boots with salt water before they go home at night, otherwise the, the souls will follow them home. <laughs> but we didn't do that. We didn't do that. And as far as I know, <laughs> everyone's got a spirit in their home with them. Yeah. <laughs> well, that explains it. Yeah. <laughs> but just to, just to fit a quick summary of some issues that I think um, could have some work done on them. Just to recap, that come up? No. Um, excavation time on sites is frequently cut to accommodate the contractor's delays, and I think a lot of people don't realise that at all. Um, 
we're often treated as dispensable labour, that whole thing of, like, if there's a shortage of archaeologists on site, a lot of people come down from the office, you know, because anyone can... I mean, a lot of them, to be fair, are pretty good. Um, <coughs> women are still often asked to get changed in toilets, showrooms and cleaning cupboards. Still, now, even now. And uh, the National Planning Policy Framework, which is kind of my original kind of uh, guide for this, it requires archaeologists for everything from infrastructure to house extension projects, which of course is great, but it also means we're spread very thin, and I don't think there's, I don't think there's enough of us, actually, and there's not enough good people able to train all the other new people, and it's a shame because people are, are missing out on, on a lot of training and a lot of things are shortcuts now being taught instead of the basics. And so there are issues, I think, around that whole system. So how do we keep people in a commercial archaeology? The main thing, better pay, better pay, definitely keep people, better communication with contractors as well on site so that you know if they're about to swing something over your head and they're not about to. Um, more practical training from universities and information to them. So much more kind of, it'd be good if there was more, thing, more stuff in place so that when you got someone on site, they were kind of better for them as well, that they can just get stuck in straight away. And more interaction with the public. And that's it. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you.